Adam Shartoff, and welcome to another episode of Film Wax Radio, the independent film talk show. Every week, we're visited by filmmakers, actors, journalists, programmers, and others to discuss the state of independent film. Beginning on Wednesday, July 25th, Film Wax is beginning a new monthly micro series about gentrification and development called Brooklyn Reconstructed. To launch this series, which will take place at the Brooklyn Society for Ethical Culture at 53 Prospect Park West in Park Slope, we will screen Kelly Anderson and Allison Lirish Dean's documentary, My Brooklyn, a recent award winner at the Brooklyn Film Festival. The screening, co presented by Families United for Racial and e- Economic Equality, or FURY, will also include a post screening discussion, as will all the films in the series. Some of the other titles in the series, including Megan Sperry's The Domino Effect, Michael Galinsky, Suki Hawley, and David Balinson's Battle for Brooklyn, Jen Sanko and Fiore de Rosa's The Vanishing City, Isabel Hill's Made in Brooklyn, and more. Joining me today are several filmmakers involved in Brooklyn Reconstructed and who, to their great credit, have gone through the time-consuming and the economic and emotionally exhaustive process of making a film about this subject, a complex one about development and gentrification, things which are radically changing the fiber of our neighborhoods. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome back to the show filmmakers Kelly Anderson and Michael Galinsky, and welcome for the first time Sue Friedrich and Suki Hawley. So I uh, welcome everybody to Film Wax Radio. Mm-hmm. Let's just go around and say say something about uh, who we are, and uh, inter- we'll sort of introduce all of our guests today. So, okay. first up is Sue Friedrich. Friedrich. Sue, who's uh, your your new film got renovation? Just was at Brooklyn Film Festival. Uh, yeah, I, I finished got renovation a couple of months ago, but I spent about six years making it. It's a film about the rezoning of Williamsburg. And I lived there for 20 years, so when the rezoning happened in 2005, I decided I'd better record what was going to disappear, and I just started shooting, and over the course of the next few years, I shot a lot of footage of the demolitions and constructions, and then we also lost the place that we lived, so I started right. recording that, and that's what it, it turned into. Uh, it's a highly personal film, and... Um was it uh well let's let's go around we'll, we'll we'll continue and then we'll come back to it uh kelly anderson whose film my brooklyn was also at the brooklyn film festival uh and and and, and my brooklyn you also was a an, a painstakingly long process for you i uh it took six years and uh allison lirish dean and i made the film because we heard that the city was redeveloping the fulton street mall area um which was a really vibrant um, African-American and Caribbean shopping and cultural district, and the third most profitable shopping area in all of New York City, which a lot of people don't know. Um, And so we tried to answer the question, why would the city be redeveloping an area that was already so thriving and successful? And uh, into that mix, we also interjected my personal story of being in Brooklyn since 1988 and trying to sort out the changes I'd seen neighborhoods go through and um, look at some issues of race and class and city policy and try to understand sort of um, to what extent we can deal with gentrification in terms of just looking at individuals and where they choose to live and where there are bigger policy issues at stake. So there's a lot of overlap with the other films here, with with Sue's film in particular. We looked a lot at rezoning and mm-hmm. these hundred rezonings that the Bloomberg administration has done, um, which have had a huge impact on reshaping the city. So, mm-hmm. And uh, thank you. And uh, then we have uh, Suki, Holly, and Michael Galinsky, who are here as well. And their film, Battle for Brooklyn, has had a... Um, an ongoing sort of life. I mean, it's, uh, seems to keep, uh, keep going. And, and I guess partly I can take some of the blame, at least now going into its next screening. Um, but, uh, and I, um, can you just, uh, talk a little bit about also the, uh, sort of origins of battle for Brooklyn? Um, we, uh, we started filming battle for Brooklyn. I guess it was in 2004, very early 2004 when we saw, um, a, a flyer, denouncing the arena project, the Atlantic Yards project. Oh, is it came down to a flyer? Yeah. That's what spurred yeah. the whole, okay. Well, we'd heard about the arena coming and thought, right. 
oh, is that is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. You mm-hmm. know, the, the neighbors and we discussed it and we weren't sure. I then saw the flyer that seemed to denounce everything about it. And we were like, oh, there there's probably more to this than the press release that we read and in, that in terms of the New York Times article that we read. Mm-hmm. Um, so we called the number on the flyer and it was one of the strong project opponents, Patty Hagan. And, you mm-hmm. know, she said, I'm, you know, started spewing so much information that sounded very credible. So we said, hold on, we'll be there and we'll, we'll start shooting right away. Mm-hmm. Spent, you know, f- a week and a half just shooting with Patty. And then eventually she said, do you know Dan Goldstein? You know, there are all these, you know, loft dwellers who, who are going to be affected by this. And I think they're not, nobody's going to fight. But there's this one guy, Dan Goldstein, who might fight. You should meet him. And actually, we knew him. And uh, he he was a friend of a friend. And Mm -hmm. so it was like, oh, we know Dan. We should go and started shooting with him. And it became a very personal film um, because of that. I think because of that connection. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. Uh, Just uh, if if in the early stages where you were thinking uh, uh, all along, I I want this to be a political statement. I, I mean, I want this to reach a lot of people and I want to make a difference. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. And. Part of the answer is, that question often goes, and did you try and use the film to affect the project? And be, because of that idea that we wanted it to be kind of more far-reaching, we really were very um, assiduous about not having the footage be a part of the fight. As much as we sometimes felt aligned with the fight, um, we felt like it would uh, diminish its value you know, ex post facto, and we wanted it to be something where it became part of the history. And if it became part of the fight, it, it wouldn't reach as many people. So that was a, it was a major effort to not have it feel like a part of the fight. And, and how do you think it came out? It was a terrible idea. We should have been <laughs> fighting from the beginning. We should have been using it as a battering ram to stop this horrible project. But, you know, you live, you learn. Well, I sort of see documentary as being inherently bound up with social change. So um, to me, all my films have had a really strong point of view. And um, I feel like uh, with this film, certainly we were open to hearing new information and conflicting information, you know, all the way through the process. And that only made it deeper and deeper. But I think my goal for the film was less about stopping the rezoning of downtown Brooklyn, because that had happened already, and more about changing the way that people think about these issues so that rather than just sort of walking around the city and people just saying like wow how did all those condos get there (laughs) that maybe they would actually be tuned in enough to the process in the future to think about how to have an involvement in in the um, land use and development process and also just not to always think of gentrification as this kind of natural normal uh, change that happens and to really think of it much more as something that's the product of decision making um, at a higher level. I mean, I think what is interesting is that we're all sitting here and we've all basically went on the same journey. And one film is interesting, two films is more interesting, and three films really forces a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that we always attempt to do when we make a movie is make it about media. So we film a lot of people um, being interviewed by the media to illustrate that the media really doesn't understand what's going on because then you sometimes get a sense of what then they report, and it, it never has anything to do with what really is going on. And they never know what's going on when they come to do these yeah. in-depth things. Uh, and so that's what we kind of try and argue with our film. But if you argue it with a series of films that are all saying the same thing, it's about time that somebody kind of says, wait, you know, maybe I should take my head out of my butt and start to pay it a little bit of attention. Mm-hmm. It's not going to happen, but it's a nice thing to right. think. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I, I had the feeling from uh, living in the East Village back in the late 70s, early 80s, when it started gentrifying and things started disappearing, and then a year or two later I would pass by and think, oh, what was there? And I couldn't remember, and I, I had sworn I would remember everything, and I couldn't mm-hmm. remember. And so I had such a strong feeling that Williamsburg was going to go the same way, and I didn't want to forget. And if it n- required having footage to remember, then so be it. But I really wanted to remember it. And um, and I and I didn't feel at all that what I was doing at the time could stop it. And it would have been interesting, like if I had footage, as you mentioned with your film, if I had footage that somebody could have used in a demonstration. But it seemed like such a foregone conclusion, even when I started shooting, let alone over the next couple of years, that I didn't think of it as being useful at the time. But I do think the act of bearing witness to something like that mm-hmm. is really important or to Lanark Yards or you know Fulton Mall I mean all these places that we bear witness to this devastation that's being wrought and um, 
you know, I, and I was just rereading this stuff about Jane Jacobs and, you know, talking about what happened with the expressway, the lower Manhattan expressway or the West Village. And, you know, the same kinds of struggles they were having in the 60s about this is <clears throat> what went on in, in these cases. And so in a way, one thinks, oh, well, you know, it just sort of keeps going on, even though people know about what happened before. But still, you have to keep paying attention so that people don't think it's a given, like you said. Right. Well, you really have to, because even as we show the film to, say, urban planners and architects, we, we showed the film in St. Louis at Washington University, and the guy who did the question and answer afterwards had the previous week hosted the architects from SHOP who were designing the arena, and they had no idea. They were like, oh, I, you know, I didn't realize that this was going on. You know? And it was kind of an awkward thing, because they had spent a week fetting these guys and showing this great design. And so even architects and urban planners, it's somewhat mildly willful ignorance of how we get to where we get because you know if they if they don't try and push these things they don't get to make the pretty things that they want to make um and so even the people you would think that would be kind of um on the side of trying to do it the right way are on the side of actually the highway of trying to push things through because they want to make big impressive projects and really the only way you can make big impressive projects at this point is to screw people over there's almost no way right. to do it without and um, I mean it's interesting because we're sitting where I'm looking at the window it's kind of nice that I can see trees but that's because Robert Moses tore down that whole three block section across the street and there's a guy at the street who lived here then he was a seven year old or something and his friend came across the street and said Georgie we gotta go three weeks later everybody was gone because nobody would fight nobody even could think to fight like it just, and when was yeah. that built? That was in the what was it, mid-50s, I think. You know, what your films address and what they all seem to have in common is, is recognizing that it's, a, it's a, actually, an, a dis, they're not only the, uh, relying on that passivity, but also fostering it. We're ch we're, you can't do anything. Change is good. Change is normal. It is what it is. Uh, when, in fact, that's a great great idea for every, all the people that are, are, have something to gain from this to, you know, to... Uh, to, to push out there. Sometimes the thing to gain is simply that their job is to promote these things. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's interesting that, Sue, you mentioned Jane Jacobs and the West Village Highway proposal and that that was stopped, and yet every single one of our cases was successful, you know, it, it, mm -hmm. for the city. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, even as you said, even though we know what they're doing, but and, and yet we can't even overcome them, um, you know, people who are opposed to this sort of thing. It's really it makes me think we need Jane Jacobs to still be alive. Like, you know, I don't know. Was it just her? I mean, I no, no, it wasn't just her, of course. But what is it that made it possible for, let's say, the Williamsburg rezoning to happen? And and and. Well, the idea that not only is change normal, but that it's it's good. You know, mm -hmm. this is very the people eating outside on sidewalks is a really good thing. You know, somehow now that I, you know, after seeing your film, I'm like, really, is that? And I see everyone eating outside on sidewalks. I kind of hate it now. And I'm like, I'm not going to eat outside again. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, you know, is that really something that's so important? Or, you know, I know it's just a sign of, of something. Well, I think it's important, though, to recognize that a lot of people's attachment, I mean, there's a lot of things that have come with the reinvestment in the city, you know, in Brooklyn particularly, that we like, you know, I mean, people like having restaurants to go to, you know, if you could have some of this change and better schools and, you know, the things that we want without having the massive displacement that happens at the same time, you know, I think part of the roadblock in terms of people getting this issue is that they're attached to the things that they like about Brooklyn, the farmers markets and so on, right? And so to me, the question is, how do you have that stuff, you know, and, and spread the benefit a little more equally? Is well, it possible to have reinvestment without displacement? It's absolutely impossible. It's absolutely possible. You just, you, put in farmers markets and you invest a very small amount in supporting them until they get going and then you get the communities to do it. You don't have to just have gentrifiers push those things. You can have policies right. that push them without pushing people out. One thing you pointed out, you said, we, you know, we want good schools. Well, one of the big problems of the downtown rezoning, as your film points out, is that it was really meant to be office rezoning. Instead, it became, you know, upper middle class rezoning and then they won't go to the schools in the neighborhood. You know, right. and so now they're all complaining. They're calling Tish James and saying, oh, we can't go to that school. You need to get us a new school. But nobody planned for a school. And there's no so there's no money for a school. And then they won't. You know, so now you're just having even further kind of um, divisive racial problems because they won't go to 270 because it's, you know, right. a lot of kids in the projects go there. And like, God forbid their children should mingle. Mm -hmm. If they declare an area blighted, which we know from Atlantic Yards, you know, or in Williamsburg, they they decide it's blighted, and then 
businesses won't move in because they're hearing that it's blighted and they know, you know, there's the drumbeat like, uh oh, something's going to change here and we're not going to survive this change. It's so insider new, trading, essentially. Yeah. So new businesses don't come in. So there's fewer and fewer businesses. Schools start falling apart. And then they say, oh, well, you see, it's blighted. So we have to tear it down. And so they just they sort of make it happen when it wasn't like that to begin with and that certainly happened in Williamsburg and the thing about you know farmers markets or restaurants is that you know Williamsburg obviously went through a real change we I mean we moved in in 1989 and over the next you know eight or ten years there was definitely a change different kinds of people were moving in there were a few more restaurants you know but for a while it maintained a very happy level of a mixture of economic classes not so much racial because it was very the it was very hard for black people to get a place in that neighborhood it was very clearly that they were being kept out but um but in other ways there was a sort of happy middle ground and and then with the development it flipped over into this extreme state but if the city had been giving money to maintain the schools or improve the schools and give a little more money to the businesses so they could invest and pay whatever rent they needed to, it would have been really nice. But then they pushed it to the point that it wasn't viable for the majority of people who live there anymore. Well, there was a, a big piece in the Times a couple of weeks ago about Amanda Burden, mm. the city planning right. commission, and, um, and about the fantastic job that she's been doing. And of course, they were praising Williamsburg and whatever other neighborhoods. And, you know, she's only got a few months left before she le leaves office. And, you know, she hopes she can do everything else she possibly wants to before then. And at one point, they quoted her as saying she likes to think of herself as sort of combining the good intentions, or however she put it, of Jane Jacobs with the sort of vigor of Robert Moses. And I think this is typical of them, that they somehow think they can do both things, which are diametrically opposed, right. what he does, what right. she does, you know. Right. And you can't. Well, there's been studies of these rezonings, which have actually talked about the fact that, yeah, for some people in the city, you get to have neighborhood character and small scale, you know, neighborhood character, low rise buildings. And, and so what they've done, and uh, the Furman Center at NYU has really written about this a lot, um, is that they've protected that kind of Jane Jacobs quality of street life in neighborhoods that are more homeowners, more white, although not predominantly, and more middle and upper class. Uh, and then in neighborhoods that are more rental and more people of color, they've tended to you know, do these massive upzonings. Um, so there's a real uh, way that the rezoning is creating an even more unequal geography. Um, and then... You know, it gets complicated because they'll claim that they also upzone because of, you know, things that are around transit hubs. But even accounting for all that, there still is this sort of um, real inequality that's being amplified through through the geography. It's amplified through geography, but also through power. So, for instance, you as you pointed out, it's mostly landlords. Landlords want upzoning because they're not in invested in a neighborhood. What they're invested in is the value of their property. If you upzone a property that was you know, zoned for four families. It was maybe worth $500,000 as a raised property. Now it's uh, up zoned so you can build 80 stories. That property is worth $10 million. So, uh, of course, those people are going to lobby for it. And if you're going to go from 500000 to $10 million, you're going to grease palms. You're going to contribute to the people. And you're going to just basically wield the, the, the minor levels of power that you have. So it becomes slightly less nefarious how these wheels work. But the fact it is power... And then what it was always coming back to is this kind of sense of powerlessness that we have no voice. So in each one of our situations, the people who actually lived in these areas find out about these things after the fact. And so, you know, other people outside of go, well, you know, the government has to do what it has to do. But I think what it has to do is it has to listen to people who live actually somewhere. And I think, you know, rezonings really are a form of eminent domain because they're, they are taking value from people or conferring value but in that conferring there is a sense of the people who actually live there maybe they aren't owners but they lose all power and um i think the the good thing about it's not just these few films there's so many things bubbling up but like there is a sense of knowledge and so at the end of battle for brooklyn mayor bloomberg says no one's no one's gonna care how long it took they're just gonna see that it was done you know and we're trying to use that as a mantra to say, well, actually, if you look at all these films, 
we are remembering how long it took. We are remembering what it took. And, and so these are the cycles. So this is the kind of the new era. I mean, these films combined in some way are the new Jane Jacobs because it's going to take a while for them to be the chicken little. Uh, and that's why they're like, we got to push through uh, Amanda Burden's policies because they won't be able to once Bloomberg is run out of town because the, the people are becoming more united. Well, I was just going to say, it's also a question of language all the time with these people. So uh, there was a, a thing written recently about my film by a guy who's from some sort of urban planning group, whatever, I can't remember who. And he said, oh, this is a film made by somebody who thinks all change is bad. And I thought that's so interesting because um, if you dis- define or describe these kinds of situations as as change, then it suggests that they might be good because change has the possibility of being a good thing, you know. Well, no, it but it's always it's always insisted that change is a good thing by these r- people. Right, right, right. And I love and, that we use these people. But if you call it Inevit- destruction, inevitable. you know, if I say no, in fact, it's destruction that I think is bad. I think change can be good, but that's not what happened in Williamsburg. It wasn't changed. It was r- sort of ruined. The the but, old. But it was also Williamsburg. ripped out from under. It yes, wasn't. It wasn't. Yes. Um, uh, an involvement of the people, like exactly. the government coming to a group of people and saying, hey, let's work with you. What, what do you guys exactly. want? Mm-hmm. Right. You know? So they come from outside and say, this is the change we're going to confer on you. Right. And it means you're out of here. But, it, but it's also couched oftentimes as this kind of liberal idea. And that's what's mm-hmm. really, really, really enervating about the situation is that. Um, so we were talking before, like uh, we said, our film isn't seen as a social issue documentary because essentially the people fighting it are fighting what is seen as a good liberal thing, housing. So, for instance, we would, you know, we wrote to a Democratic muckety-muck, and she said, oh, let me forward it to somebody as we were working on it, see if they could help you. Oh, no, they're, they're for this project because it's going to provide housing and jobs. And it, it's just they use these things, and, and people are so um, – they, they should know this now. They should know as soon as uh, someone says uh, housing, that's when I reach for my revolver because that means they're coming, you know. And, um, and it's not going to involve the people that are there. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it goes back, I mean, Moses used the same thing. We're building middle class housing. So we're going to kick out the poor and build housing for middle class. And nobody actually asked, where, where do those poor people, people go? Right. Right. Uh, the, the, for, yeah, and the answer, of course, is even further away from their jobs and further away from, you know, their, their, their communities. And, yeah. disenfra- and they're disenfranchised. Uh, and, and, and we're speaking with Michael Galinsky and Suki Hawley, uh, Battle for Brooklyn, Kelly Anderson, uh, whose film My Brooklyn will actually be the, the first film, as I mentioned earlier, to launch Brooklyn Reconstructed. We're going to have our screening at the uh, Brooklyn Society for Ethical Culture at 53 Prospect Park West on Wednesday evening, July 25th at 7 o'clock. And uh, so I appreciate the Brooklyn Society for being so supportive of what we're doing here because it's kind of ambitious and it's, I don't know. I, I'm not, I haven't invited Marty Markowitz out yet. <laughs> I'm not sure he'll, he'd come, but we'll, we'll, we'll extend an invitation. Uh, Sue Friedrich's film is called uh, Gut Renovation. And by the way, it should be said, a very, very, very uh, memorable device that you use is the map. You want to you wanna just sort of say how that sort of like kind sure. of occurred to you it's really memorable yeah i um i was going around the neighborhood on my bike for you know a couple of years uh getting footage of all these places and i had to keep track of them so i had a little xerox blow up map of the neighborhood and i had little red squares for each of them and they were numbered and i got to 173 sites and this is only between McCarran Park and the BQE South and then the mm-hmm. river and the BQE East. So like about 15 blocks long by six blocks wide. So not a very big area, 173 sites. So then I start putting the film together with 40 hours of footage. And I think, how in God's name am I going to get people to know what they're looking at? And so for a long time, I was editing it with really big numbers in, on top of each building when you would see it. And I thought, oh, this is good. You, and it looks scary, like big red numbers. And it looks really threatening. And then my partner looked at it and said, I have no idea what I'm looking at, where it is. And she looked at the neighborhood, you know. So I thought, mm, that doesn't work. So I thought I would go back to this map and then use that as a device to run through the film at different moments. So you sort of count up or down, as the case may be, um, as you're watching the film. So when you see um, various condos in the film, you don't necessarily know exactly where they are in relation to the map but still you get this sense through the film of this like 
you know, thing. Oh, totally. Very much so. so did you all find this, uh, by the way, from a filmmaking standpoint, the one of the biggest challenges was all the information, all the emotion to somehow make something that was uh, kind of organized, uh, like you had to use organizing principles to try to, so that way your audience could sort of digest it. I mean, there was a lot going on. Well, films about urban planning and development are very, uh, for lack of a better word, you know, they can be wonky. I mean, there's a lot of deep information that you're trying to convey. And yeah, this problem of people just not knowing where they are, because you have a lot of like medium shots and close ups of buildings and maybe even a few wide shots and people like, I don't know where I am. So, yeah, I, we also use maps in our film um, quite a bit um, also to show like, yeah, otherwise it's impossible to get a sense of how these developments are playing out on the ground in, in a film without people just having their eyes glaze over. I mean, hope, we've all sort of found different strategies for doing that. We found it very difficult to introduce other characters besides, you know, Dan Goldstein and Patty. Um, and in fact found that it distracted people too much to know anything about anyone else who was fighting this. And, you know, it was important to show that it was a big movement. It wasn't just two people fighting this, although sometimes it felt like it was. But, you know, it was many, many people. And so, but as soon as we introduced someone in a character-driven film that, like Battle for Brooklyn, everybody, you know, led down a rabbit hole where people were like, who's that? I want to know more about that person, you know? <laughs> and you couldn't go follow that person. So we eventually ended up stripping out most of the, uh, you know, ancillary characters and just trying to show that there were other people there, but not show them too much right that was that was like a six month or eight month process of kind of building in all these other people but it just got so boring they're, right, they're they they can not right. not convey the same idea and so people get bored but you you know talking about the map and that it's interesting when you talk about the 80 percent like that's exactly the point i was making before those were all landlords so they they were just super happy to stop leases and and sell their properties and move to florida because they weren't invested in the community mm -hmm. and, and Part of that had to do with actually an earlier process of um, supporting small landlords in renovating those buildings. Like the la many of the landlords in um, Williamsburg got incredibly low interest loans and got to buy the buildings that were abandoned basically for twenty thousand dollars, et cetera. And so they would buy one and then fix it up with a grant from the city and get it inhabited. And that's kind of the process by which Williamsburg started to become a, an extension of the East Village because these, it was, I think, largely a lot of Dominican landlords and Polish landlords were getting money from the city to fix up buildings that were totally derelict, which was, which was actually a great program. But what it led to in this other way was a, a lack of ownership community. It led to a very young creative community, mm -hmm. which then, you know, didn't have um, financial stability and, and roots. So it's this kind of this complex interplay. And so the one thing to learn is, okay, maybe what we need to do is support both. Like, you know, maybe you can only do it one building as a landlord owner so that you have to be the, th that's a good policy. So when you start talking about policy, okay, how do we take these areas and, and get community investment in them and then allow that community investment to stay and, and community to really form. But what they did basically was create a, an incentive to not have roots. Right. essentially and which is what made it just like it, it's almost like you can think of it like the Colorado wildfires they stopped the ability to kind of keep things going so when the brush fire came through there was no stopping it right. but also I mean they could have done there was a community plan in Williamsburg that was mm -hmm. developed over 10 right. years where people really said we don't want gentrification on the waterfront we want that to be open to the public we want to keep manufacturing zones mm -hmm. we want to get you know instead of just you know, the same thing that happened downtown was just like these open-ended zonings where like we're going to upzone and then let you do whatever you want, right. you know, as you mentioned in our, about yeah. our film, you know, they, they justified it based on the idea that they wanted to have office jobs come to downtown Brooklyn, but they left it open enough so that you could build high-rise housing. So I mm -hmm. think, you know, the role of city planning should be to plan. Exactly what you said is they, they said, hey, community who's here, Let's involve you. But they had no actual real desire to involve them. That was all to placate them while they pushed through this other thing. Because in reality, the people who were making all this noise about what they wanted for their community didn't have any power in the community because right. they didn't have any connection to the politicians. They didn't have uh, a sense of, what it, of the power levers and that ownership is super important because if you don't own and actually care about a community because eventually what happened is most of those landlords ended up moving to Long Island and they just came back to oversee their properties and they were doing just great but they didn't have any interest in having the community become more of a wedded community where education was important etc 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 quickly I will uh, recap 
some of the uh, events that are happening then. So on, on Wednesday, July 25th, we're going to start with uh, My Brooklyn. And, and then uh, in August, on the 29th, we will screen Megan Sperry's The Domino Effect. On September 26th, we will then screen Battle for Brooklyn. I'm so excited to screen this movie finally. And then I know in October, I think it's the 24th, we'll be screening Vanishing City. And then in November and December and on, we'll have some more announcements. So I thank you, Sue Friedrich, whose film Gut Renovation will be soon available for screening. And I urge you to run and see it. Kelly Anderson's My Brooklyn. I'm sure the lifespan is just beginning for your film. It's terrific. And then, of course, Battle for Brooklyn's Michael, Michael Galinsky and Suki Hawley. Thank you all for stopping in and allowing me to uh, try and pull off this ambitious idea. So th- thanks, everybody. Thank you for doing it. Yeah.